Um, look, thank you uh, for, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you uh, today. Uh, I want to uh, first uh, add my acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of the land on which we uh, meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders uh, past, present and emerging. Uh, I also want to recognise the work of the Australian Naval Institute in convening this seminar uh, on uh, certainly a central national security issue, um, and uh, I'm pleased to provide um, my views today on this issue through the prism of diplomacy and foreign policy. Um, to just give a little bit of, uh, of uh, historical context, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, protectionist trade policies shaped the global economy uh, in, in very profound ways. However, in the wake of two world wars, the nexus between the, flee, the free flow of global trade through um, multilateral agreements and the uh, prospect uh, for peace was recognised by world leaders. Uh, and Australia's leadership, uh, participation and influence in multilateral economic and security architecture that emerged from this realisation uh, has really been uh, instrumental in underpinning our prosperity. Uh, as Prime Minister Morrison recently highlighted, everything stems uh, from the strength of our economy. Australia's trade performance contributes very strongly to our economic prosperity. Uh, trade and economic security are thus, uh, uh, and national security, I'm sorry, uh, are thus uh, tightly intertwined. And uh, what that requires from us, a whole of government uh, endeavour uh, that draws together uh, many different uh, agencies uh, and indeed many uh, uh, represented here in this, uh, in this room. Um, I'd also like to, to uh, uh, note that um, e-commerce uh, has become a you know, very important uh, way for Australia to trade with the rest of the world, uh, opening many opportunities for Australian businesses and consumers. Around half of Australian businesses are already engaged in the digital economy in some way, and this number will inevitably uh, grow. Uh, global powers are also competing to shape the new economy and the future of digital trade. Uh, the growth in digital trade, however, will, be, will I, I expect, be complementary and not replace the ongoing need for the physical transportation of consumer goods, bulk commodities, and energy product. So the need for these kinds of, uh, of capabilities, vessels, and the need to protect them um, is uh, certainly going to uh, uh, continue uh, in parallel to the growth of, uh, uh, of, of digital commerce. Um, now, of course, uh, as you'll have heard all through uh, the, this, uh, this seminar, um, we are in the midst of a paradigm shift uh, uh, to a more contested and complex strategic environment. Uh, that means difficult choices in relation to increased great power competition and the, and the prospect uh, of uh, non-aligned regional interests. Uh, the international rules-based system and institutions that help maintain peace and security and, and guide global co cooperation are under great strain. Uh, and in some cases, uh, major powers are ignoring or undermining international law. Uh, the resilience of the multilateral trading system is being tested. Uh, nationalism and protectionism are again on the rise, which could create strategic friction damage economic growth and undermine the rules that support the flows of trade and investment. In this context, uh, the 2017 Foreign uh, Affairs White Paper uh, provided the framework uh, that charts a course for Australia in this uh, time of strategic uh, change, and it articulates a vision for the type of region we want. Um, and three key themes in that, uh, in that vision are, uh, are a neighbourhood which, in which adherence to rules delivers lasting peace, where the rights of all states are respected and where open markets facilitate the free flow of trade, capital and ideas. Now, uh, within that, uh, that context, um, uh, the White Paper recognised that uh, the Indo-Pacific region is one of the key theatres where these pressures are playing out. Approximately 80% of global trade by volume is transported by sea, 60% of that through Asia, uh, with the South China Sea uh, carrying an estimated one-third of global shipping. By 2030, the Indo-Pacific Indo is expected to be home of the world's five largest economies, China, the US, India, Indonesia and Japan. Uh, this economic growth uh, brings opportunities and increased prosperity. However, the stability of the Indo-Pacific region, which has underpinned its economic transformation, cannot be assumed, uh, with major power competition now part of the landscape. The future balance of power in the region will depend largely on the actions of the US, China and major powers such as India and Japan but it can be shaped by middle and emerging powers uh, such as Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, the Republic of Korea, and of course, Australia. Uh, economic growth in the Indo-Pacific benefits all nations and 
Uh, as such, Australia uh, aims to ensure that as the region evolves, it evolves peacefully so that countries can prosecute their interests free from coercive power and so that economic momentum is sustained. And of course, as we've just heard, that's uh, uh, a much more challenging task uh, uh, than we might, uh, we might like to hope. Um, so we're committed to working with our partners across the region to strengthen uh, political security and economic architecture uh, and to help build regional norms uh, in ways that, uh, that protect those and advance those, uh, those interests. Um, now, uh, key to this uh, is a uh, uh, fundamental uh, realisation that Australian and US interests in the region are very clearly aligned. During the recent Osmin Dialogue, our foreign and defence ministers, along with uh, their US counterparts, set a path forward for Australia-US uh, uh, alliance effort to build a secure, prosperous future. Our joint efforts uh, focus on, um, first of all, Indo-Pacific uh, prosperity and stability, uh, where we'll be working together to support a secure, reliable and affordable supply of energy, including uh, cooperation and coordination for capacity building on maritime security issues with Indo-Pacific countries and in the Indian Ocean. Uh, also focusing on enhancing engagement in Southeast Asia uh, by supporting the implementation of ASEAN's Indo-Pacific outlook, including, uh, that's a policy construct, uh, including practical projects in areas of maritime security and economic development. Um, both committed to stepping up Pacific engagement, uh, supporting uh, the uh, implementation of the uh, BOA Regional Security Declaration, uh, reaffirming our global partnership uh, to, uh, in particular, preserving freedom of navigation and regional maritime security in vital sea lanes, and deepening our defence cooperation um, by increasing security cooperation with, part well, including uh, increasing security cooperation with partners in the region through joint training and exercise opportunities. So these commitments uh, underscore our shared priorities for the Indo-Pacific and the role of US global leadership uh, in helping us prosecute Australian national interests. Without strong US political, economic and security engagement in the region, power is likely to shift more profoundly and it will be more difficult for Australia to achieve the level of security and stability we seek. So turning to uh, particular issues for, for maritime trade and particularly around trade disputes, um, economic growth uh, underpinned by prospects for increased seaborne trade uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, has a bright uh, outlook. However, risks such as increased inward-looking policies and the rise of, rise of trade protectionism are of concern. An immediate uh, issue is, uh, are the trade tensions between China and the US, as well as those uh, are seen between Canada, Mexico and the US and the European Union. Trade tensions have increased global policy uncertainty and undermine confidence, investment, manufacturing output, trade and overall economic growth. Australia's position on trade uh, disputes uh, uh, that are promoting protectionism is based on um, uh, a number of key principles. First of all, uh, a commitment to open markets with trade and investment relationships based on rules, not coercion, an approach which builds resilience and sovereignty, respect for international law and the, and the peaceful resolution of disputes without the threat or use of coercive power, and a commitment to cooperation and burden sharing within strong and resilient regional architecture. So part of that uh, will, of course, uh, depend on um, uh, working multinationally. Uh, uh, so Australia's multi, multi and bilateral relationships and memberships of multinational fora are key to achieving our aims. Our work through the multilateral mechanisms uh, involved in these processes provide the impetus for balancing great, great power competition guarding against protectionism and building robust support for open economic settings. Our approach uh, in multilateral organisations such as the World Trade Organisation and the G20 seeks to reinforce the strength, accountability and effectiveness of these institutions to leverage the relative strength of each in pursuing collaborative uh, interests. Regionally, uh, the institutions established in Southeast Asia are of vital interest to us, especially um, as Southeast Asia represents uh, uh, the locus of major, uh, major power comp uh, competition in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and also because uh, uh, at a very practical level, 50% of our exports and 37% of, of our imports pass through uh, the region in uh, 2017. Uh, Australia is committed to working with our partners across the region to strengthen political security and economic architecture and to help build regional norms. We're intensifying our commitment to ASEAN, uh, a key partner in shaping uh, a multipolar order. Uh, and we support uh, ASEAN's leadership, uh, particularly its role as a convener of the region's most important forums, including the ASEAN Regional Forum and the East Asia Summit. 
but we also engage with other important regional institutions, including the Pacific Islands Forum, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, as well as minilateral groupings uh, like uh, the Trilateral Strategic Dialogue between Australia, the US and Japan, and the Quadrilateral Group, which uh, involves those three countries plus India. Uh, stability and prosperity in our region uh, is enabled by uh, efforts undertaken through these, in, these critical institutions. Uh, another key element, of course, as I'm sure you will have uh, uh, heard often uh, uh, during the course of the discussions, is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the place of, of uh, principles of freedom of navigation. Uh, for Australia, a nation reliant on the maintenance of safe, secure and open sea lanes for the preservation of trade, our position is very clear. All states have a right to expect safe pass passage of their maritime trade consistent with international law. Uh, through diplomacy, we try to ensure international law, especially uh, UNCLOS, is uh, respected and implemented to protect freedom of navigation and to uphold the sovereign rights of coastal states in their exclusive economic zones. Australia will continue to exercise our rights of freedom of navigation and overflight, consistent with long-standing policy, and conduct cooperative activities with other countries consistent with international law. Australia's recent decision to commit forces to protect tra uh, trade flows through the Straits of Hormuz uh, is uh, uh, very much consistent with this, uh, this position. Now, uh, turning to uh, the, the future, um, when we think about how rapidly uh, changes can impact geopolitics, international security, world trade and business, um, it's uh, worth reflecting that this year marks the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, which brought about, of course, the symbolic end of the Cold War. Um, but as with uh, geopolitics, we're seeing a new multipolar multi world economic configuration emerging, uh, and that poses many challenges, uh, of course, as, um, uh, as some of which I've, I've, I've already uh, touched on, but it also opens many opportunities for both our economy and our security. Uh, these global trends will have profound impacts on maritime trade requirements, national resource exploitation, an emerging shift of geopolitical configurations, increasing demand uh, on our national security architecture, or demands on our national security architecture, and increasing demand uh, for sustainable energy resources. Some of the key global trends emerging, um, the underlying factors which drive, and, and drive them and where they're headed uh, and how they might interact uh, include uh, issues like demography, uh, demogra demography uh, where, where we're seeing uh, uh, very much a, a persistence of unequal distribution of population growth, uh, aging populations, uh, and uh, uh, a shift in, the, in a sense, the, the global hotspots of the location of population, particularly uh, uh, around uh, uh, Asia and Latin America. Uh, also, uh, urbanisation becoming uh, an even, even more significant uh, uh, driver of uh, both uh, economics and politics. Um, in uh, the economy, uh, uh, rising population uh, and economic growth uh, uh, is accompanied by uh, opportunities associated with rising consumerism. Um, manufacturers will seek to take advantage of lower transport costs associated uh, with uh, uh, the large mega vessels that we're, we're seeing now uh, uh, take to uh, take to sea, um, and this will uh, include uh, pressures to uh, uh, to find more efficient ways to use container space, uh, accompanying these uh, these these changes in. Uh, uh, in, in, in the physical properties of, uh, of, of, uh, of transportation. Um, at, at, uh, on the issue of resources, as population economies and prosperity uh, increase, so will the demand for resources, including fossil fuels, renewables, as well as food and water. And uh, uh, that's likely to see increased competition for offshore energy and, uh, and, and resources. Uh, again, impacting on the, the maritime uh, environment very directly. Um, uh, turning to the environment itself, uh, um, we'll see uh, increased pressure for greener shipping, um, reduced carbon footprint, uh, uh, use of LNG, solar and wind as, uh, uh, as, as key sources of power. Um, and uh, that too will also, I think, uh, tend to uh, increase pre pressure for the proliferation of mega, mega ships. Um, that will affect both the container and the cruise industries uh, and will have implications for uh, the way we uh, design our... Uh, our port infrastructure, uh, and indeed where port, port infrastructure needs to be. Um, uh, other important emerging trends to, to, to note include uh, technology for monitoring ship operations and performance. Um, ships will soon have a complete ne network of sensors to monitor all aspect, aspects of operations, um, and that, of course, exposes 
those systems to uh, uh, cyber risks uh, that need to be need to be managed. Um, uh, we'll also see uh, a global demand for our resources broaden to encompass uh, critical minerals, uh, something that the government has recently uh, put a lot of uh, policy attention into, um, and that's driven by the application of, uh, of these, uh, these minerals to uh, the technology that will drive the new economy, um, and also a concern around the level of concentration in global critical minerals markets, particularly uh, uh, the place of, of China in uh, uh, in, in control of, of key uh, mineral uh, supply chains. Um, now, Australia is a world leader in exploration, extraction, production and processing of these minerals, uh, and uh, the uh, supply of, of, of them, and, the, and particularly our ability to contribute to the resiliency of supply chains, um, will be an essential part of uh, our efforts to maintain economic prosperity and national security. Uh, all of those uh, dimensions will have a maritime uh, trade and maritime security dimension. In terms of uh, some of the emerging uh, challenges for foreign policy, um, we clearly see now a need to develop policy options that uh, preserve our prosperity, uh, uh, underpin our values uh, and our democratic institutions as we, as we look at these issues. So some of the issues that uh, I think will be um, you know, uh, even more prominent in our uh, policy agenda will be uh, issues around uh, maritime boundaries, particularly uh, how we manage uh, global commons and, uh, and, uh, and the resources that are in those commons. Um, uh, obviously, uh, how the international rules-based order evolves, um, particularly around protection of sea lines of communication, strategic choke points, and cyberspace. Uh, the uh, issues around risks of uh, foreign interference in port infrastructure and uh, maritime trading systems. Uh, issues around the uh, consensus on environmental policies and, uh, uh, and, and the level of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, disconnection between various countries' approaches to uh, environmental issues. Um, and uh, also assistance for emerging powers uh, to increase their stake in international systems, including in international fora, but also to help uh, developing countries benefit from opportunities including through uh, their own infrastructure. Uh, this is something that uh, Australia, the US and Japan have agreed to work uh, uh, much more closely on in terms of mobilising uh, resourcing for, uh, uh, for key, key uh, infrastructure development in uh, regional countries, uh, and that includes uh, maritime-related uh, infrastructure as a priority. So, um, in summary, um, as uh, I'm sure you'll have heard repeatedly today, uh, with great power competition heating up, uh, uh, established international rules-based orders are under stress and future trends affecting global trade will test our policy responses. Australia's economic and security interests are closely intertwined and we need to be innovative in the way we think about and respond to the new dynamics uh, in play regionally and globally. Uh, in this era of strategic competition, Australian foreign policies must prepare the country to seize opportunity and manage risk. Uh, and in that context, uh, our open economy, uh, in, in a sense, underpins our competitiveness generates uh, more and better paying jobs and gives us access to new ideas and technology. Um, it also uh, allows us to supplement our pool of, uh, of domestic savings with uh, uh, overseas investment and lowers prices for consumers and producers. Um, but taking advantage of those benefits uh, is not something we can do alone. And uh, we are more prosperous and our re regional trade is more secure because of the strong relations we have with allies uh, and with our partners in the region. Uh, now, similarly, much of that uh, depends on how the rules, how rules-based frameworks um, uh, evolve, uh, and by working with uh, with partners in coalitions and leveraging the resources and expertise of, in, of international organisations, we can shape these frameworks in ways that are favourable to our interests uh, and also uh, in line with our principles. So that's uh, a key task. The, some of the key tasks for us to uh, to pursue uh, with the, within our uh, policy world, but it's also one that clearly will intersect with yours. So thank you very much for your time.